Uh, good evening, I'm Matthew Spaulding. I'm uh, Dean of the Van Andel Graduate School of Government. Our new graduate school we've just started here this semester, just launched it. Uh, I'm also the Vice President of Hillsdale College here in Washington, D.C. Welcome to our Washington, D.C. campus. Um, we've got a, a very good uh, friend of ours here this evening giving a talk. Uh, we have uh, uh, sound, so we're, we're recording and it picks up sound, but uh, the room sound is not being very friendly to us this evening, so you'll have to bear with us. But uh, the videotape will be videotaped uh, and recorded very finely, I'm sure. Um, our co-sponsor this evening, I, I uh, would like to, to mention is the Claremont Institute. Uh, our speaker is a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute. Um, I have uh, myself uh, went to Claremont, been associated with the Claremont Institute. Uh, Ryan Williams is here somewhere. Ryan, Ryan Williams, the president of Claremont Institute, is here. Uh, and the Institute also puts out uh, the Claremont Review of Books. If anybody is interested in the best review of books in the country, uh, it comes from the Claremont Review. Uh, so we thank them for that and for all the great work and scholarship that they encourage and produce. Um, and uh, as is our custom, a student will introduce our speaker this evening, although I would like to say before she does so that uh, the particular book that our speaker is talking about this evening on property and the pursuit of happiness, I've, I've been working on it, is a fine, uh, a, a very fine piece of scholarship uh, in addition to all of his other great work um, as a teacher. Uh, Carmel Kukaji is a junior from Franklin, Tennessee, studying politics and journalism. She's the culture editor of the Hillsdale Collegian and a member of the Dow Journalism Program. And she's currently interning at the office of Representative Mark Green here on the Washington Hillsdale Leadership Program semester program. Carmel. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, I have the distinct privilege of introducing our speaker, Dr. Ed Edward Erler. Mr. Erler is a professor emeritus of political science at California State University, San Bernardino. He earned his BA from San Jose State University and his master's and PhD in government from the Claremont Graduate School. He has published numerous articles on constitutional topics in journals such as Interpretation, the Notre Dame Journal of Law, and the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. He was a member of the California Advisory Commission on Civil Rights from 1988 to 2006 and served on the California Constitutional Revision Commission in 1996. He is the co-author of The Founders on Citizenship and Immigration and author of Property and the Pursuit of Happiness, Locke, The Declaration of Independence, Madison, and The Challenge of the Administrative State. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Edward Erler. Well, thank you. I see a lot of friends in the audience. Thank you for coming tonight and to listen to me, <clears throat> especially on this <clears throat> blustery night. I appreciate the effort you uh, made to hear my screed. <laughs> I'd like to say a few things, mainly, uh, an outline of sorts of what I have said in the, in the book. I hope you all got a copy uh, when you arrived tonight, or at least some of you did. It contains everything I know <laughs> in summary uh, form, everything I've learned over the last 40 or 50 years. It is a defense of the American founding and the American regime. As you know, many uh, critics insist that the American founding was radically modern and as such is something low and contemptible. I don't have to rehearse the details for you. You are all familiar with them. They're shared by conservatives and liberals alike. Both reject the principles of the Declaration of Independence. 
those principles which the founders believed supplied the authoritative grounds for the Constitution's authority. Now, I think most of you know that John Locke had a profound influence on the American founding. But we must endeavor to understand Locke the way the founders understood Locke. Many of you are familiar with the letter that Jefferson wrote to Henry Lee when he reflected on the character of the Declaration of Independence. He said, it was intended to be an expression of the American mind. All its authority rests on the harmonizing sentiments of the day, whether expressed in conversation, in letters, in printed essays, or the elementary books of public right as Aristotle, Cicero, Locke, Sidney, and somebody named etc. <laughs> Jefferson mentions Aristotle together with Locke, seemingly unmindful of the distinction between ancients and moderns that many contemporary critics of the founders find so important. Undoubtedly, Jefferson read the books of public right with the eyes of what Aristotle ca called a phronimos, a practically wise statesman, who understood that prudence, practical wisdom, was the virtue that ruled the sphere of politics. He certainly understood Locke's natural law as a reflection or adaptation of Aristotle. In other words, Jefferson didn't read Locke the way Leo Strauss read Locke. Strauss found a radically modern Locke buried deep within his esoteric writings doing his part to extend the philosophic project initiated by Machiavelli and continued by Hobbes. But Strauss's reading of Locke was revolutionary. No one had ever before read Locke with his skill, innovation, and penetration, including, as far as we know, the most insightful philosophers. It is impossible to believe that the American founders read Locke the way Strauss did. Founders were philosophic statesmen, open to philosophy and guided by the elementary books of public right. But they were not philosophers. And if we are to understand the founders the way they understood themselves, we must understand Locke the way they understood him. As Strauss remarked, the exoteric Locke, the Locke the founders read, presented an unbroken line of respectability that stretches from Socrates to Locke. It was for this reason that he wielded an extraordinary great influence on men of affairs. Now Locke's influence on the declaration of Independence is well known. Now let me start there. Central principle of the Declaration, as you all know, is that all men are created equal. Can natural equality ever be a regime principle? Can natural equality, uh, is it really a self-evident truth? And is it a principle that would be intelligible to classical political philosophy? Would it be a part of Aristotelian natural right? Self-evident truth is one that contains the proof 
within the terms of the statement itself. For example, the axiom that things equal to the same thing are equal to each other is a self-evident truth. Anyone who understands the term same and other automatically understands the term equal and cannot fail at the same time to understanding to understand the meaning uh, cannot fail at the same uh, time to understand the truth of the statement it is an objective description of the relation of things in the world but in what sense is human quality self evident we know that there are many natural inequalities that exist among human beings, not the least of which are inequalities of strength, beauty, intelligence, moral capacity, and social capacity. We conclude, therefore, that it is also a self-evident truth that all men are not created equal in all respects. That is also a self-evident truth. They are created equal in the most important political respect, in the possession of equal rights. The Declaration, of course, addresses the question of political rule. Who should rule and who should be ruled? This question is almost always settled by accident and force. The Declaration seeks an answer that relies on deliberation and choice. You will all recognize there the language of the first number of the Federalist Papers. Whatever inequalities exist among human beings, however measured, none are great enough to make one human being or class of human beings naturally the rulers of others. As Jefferson noted, because Sir Isaac Newton was superior to others in understanding, he was not therefore lord of the person or property of others. From a slightly different point of view, one could say that the inequality, inequality between God and man is so great that whatever inequalities exist between human beings would be insignificant, indeed non-existent, in the eyes of God. Thus we might say the doctrine of the Declaration is one of natural law as well as divine law, clearly indicated not only by its recognition of a creator and a created universe, but its invocation of the laws of nature and nature's God. Natural human equality means that no one can be ruled without his consent. And consent is authorized by the laws of nature to establish only the just powers of government. The sovereignty resides with the people who can withdraw their consent whenever government becomes destructive of the ends for which it was established. The people always reserve the right of revolution as the ultimate expression of their sovereignty. Government seeks to substitute elections for revolution as the constitutional means for providing the checks on the power of government. But can equality be a regime principle? That's the question. Would Aristotle have approved of the founder's handiwork Many commentators insist that the Declaration limits the purpose of government to the security of rights, and only the security of rights. And this is a concept that was alien to Aristotle. But the Declaration's final statement about the purpose of government specifies the safety and happiness of the people, which the late Harry Jaffa 
accurately pointed out, was the alpha and omega of political life described in Aristotle's politics. If it is true, as Aristotle remarked in the politics, that man is by nature a political animal, then natural right, or at, less, at least its potential, is intrinsic to political life. How it manifests itself in any regime will depend upon political circumstances. In the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle argues that natural right is a part of political right is a part of political right. And while natural right is everywhere has the same force or power, it is everywhere changeable. It will exhibit itself differently according to different political circumstances, even though its validity does not depend on opinion or positive law. Political right is a combination of conventional and natural right the exact combination to be determined by what the Federalists called enlightened statesmen. It is true that natural human equality is not classical natural right. Classic natural right was inegalitarian. Wisdom, not consent, was the title to rule. The few wise had by nature the right to rule the many who were not wise. But in view of the theological political problem that confronted political philosophy in the post-Christian era, I say that equality was the only access to nature or natural right available to political philosophy. This meant that consent would become the sole legitimate basis for the just powers of government, but on the basis of Aristotelian natural right, this did not necessarily mean or entail a dilution of natural right, nor did it enshrine a right of unwisdom over wisdom. Here's how Leo Strauss explained it. According to the classics, the best way of meeting these, into, these two entirely different requirements, that for wisdom and that for consent or freedom, would be that a wise legislator frame a code that the citizen body, duly persuaded, freely adopts. That code, Strauss says, which is, as it were, the embodiment of wisdom must be as little subject to alteration as possible. The rule of law is to take the place of the rule of men, however wise. Now Strauss was certainly aware that this description of the classical solution is almost a description of the manner in which the American Constitution was framed and adopted with one important difference. In the place of an individual citizen of preeminent wisdom and approved integrity, Americans entrusted the framing of the organic law to a deliberative body described in the Federalist as a select body of citizens from whose common deliberation more wisdom as well as more safety might be expected, this body produced a constitution ratified by the consent of the people, embodied the rule of law. And I think we have right here behind us that body <laughs> who embodied the wisdom of the nation and produced that document that reconciled wisdom and consent, which was ratified by the people, a wise document embodying the rule of law and sent it to by the people. That was the, reconcil the reconciliation uh, that reconciled the need for wisdom and the need for consent 
which is the perfect ground specified by Aristotle as the requirements of natural right. There they are, Philadelphia. At the same time, the framers were confident that the Constitution's design would ensure the selection into constitutional offices of only those whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Another quote from the Federalist. Thus, from the point of view of classical natural right, the American founding reconciled will, wisdom and consent, natural right and political right, and probably the only way that it can ever be reconciled. Consent more or less sets the boundaries to every regime, but it is the real sovereign in every regime, in every free regime. It is the job of philosophical statesmen in an age of equality to reconcile the requirements of wisdom and consent through a politics of public opinion. Now, there is another way the American founders introduced Aristotelian natural right into the regime they were founding. And this was done on the basis of something that was either unknown to Aristotle or entirely rejected by him, the right to private property. Can this seeming paradox be explained? Well, I think so. There can be little doubt that the right to property was central or a central principle of the American founding. The founders understood property in a comprehensive sense. In a 1792 article, Madison wrote, the right to property includes, in addition to life and liberty, the right to freedom of speech and the free exercise of religion, as well as what Madison called the sacred rights of conscience. And Madison added, for good measure, the freedom to choose an occupation, the right to be free from government monopolies, and unequal taxes. The right to property thus protected the goods of the soul as well as the goods of the body. Founders' understanding of property was derived from Locke, but I believe the American founders understood property to be more extensive and more dynamic than Locke. They improved on Locke. Now, the natural right to property was central to Locke's second treatise, uh, uh, a book that was widely read and widely cited during the founding period. Now, once a private, uh, right to private property was argued and accepted as grounded in nature, mon monarchy and its attendant theological doctrine of passive obedience to government was headed for extinction. The rule of property under the English monarchy, which was subsequently embodied in the common law, was that the king owned all property in the realm and all use of the king's property was conditioned on the payment of taxes or service. Once, however, Locke articulated the labor theory of value as the foundation for the natural right to property, meaning that property belonged by right to those who created property by individual labor, the foundations of mon monarchy began to dissolve. In 1774, Jefferson, in a summary view of the rights of British America, wrote, citing Blackstone, our ancestors who migrated hither were laborers, not lawyers. In other words, our ancestors were adherents of Locke, not Blackstone and the common law. Or to say the same thing, our ancestors were adherents of natural right. Labor was the title to property, not grants or titles advanced by kings. The point of departure for Locke was natural equality, 
which inevitably results in equality of rights, life, liberty, and property. Being the sole proprietor of one's life means self-ownership. Property is created by labor, the extension of the exclusive possessions of oneself or one's body to the external world. To, uh, to transform the external world into something useful for life. Labor produces what Locke calls or says is 99.9% .9 of what is valuable in the world. Nature and the spontaneous productions of the earth are virtually worthless. No one had a right to expropriate property created by labor without violating the right of nature or natural law. And there were no natural, uh, there, there were natural uh, law limits on how much could be accumulated. No one had a right to accumulate more than he could use or exchange for other useful items. Any accumulation over the use limit would be subject to spoilage and would deprive others of the use of what was given by God in common to all men. Once money was invented, however, the use limitations were no longer enforceable. Money is not natural. It exists by convention or agreement. Gold, silver, diamonds have little intrinsic value. They are useless things that never spoil, and the accumulation of these items have only what Locke calls a fantastical value and does not deprive anyone of anything useful for life. But the accumulation of money does spur production of useful things. After the invention of money, the desire for acquisition was emancipated. No limit to accumulation after the invention of money. Thus the age of limits gave way to an age that recognized no limits on acquisition. Now capital accumulation is the engine of wealth production for individuals and for nations. Every act of private accumulation increases the stock of goods available for consumption. In most of the world's history, poverty has been endemic and the greatest tyranny has been the grinding heel of poverty. Capitalism has been successful in liberating much of the world from poverty. Locke says that God gave the world in common to men for their benefit and the greatest conveniences of life they were capable to draw from it. God did not, Locke explains, expect it to remain common and uncultivated. Rather, he gave it to the use of the industrious and rational. The capital system of accumulation has this advantage unknown to any other age before private property. Every act of private appropriation is simultaneously a contribution to the common good because it increases the goods and resources available for consumption. Protection for the natural right to property provided a common good for rich and poor that was not available in the classical world. Think of that. The idea of rights understood as claims or reservations against government was unknown to classical political philosophy. Aristotle's mixed regime, which he called the polity, a combination of oligarchy and democracy, was a re regime in which the interests of the rich and the poor served to check one another. Aristotle gave no indication, however, that rich and poor would ever share a common interest. But the right to property supplied such a common interest that could be supported equally by rich and poor. Both have an interest in the protections afforded by the right to property. The rich in maintaining their property and the poor in the prospect of securing the fruits of their labor and acquiring property in the future. Thus the foundation for republican government 
anchored in the right of property might hold the prospect of avoiding the kinds of class antagonisms that plagued ancient regimes. Aristotle had argued that a mixed regime with a large middle class would be the most stable because the middle class would be neither rich nor poor and would serve as a kind of buffer between the two antagonistic classes. A large middle class, of course, would have been a rarity in the ancient world simply because of widespread scarcity. The way of the world was a few wealthy and many poor. But with a system of private property and the emancipation of acquisition, wealth could be produced at a rate hitherto unknown. This increase in abundance makes it possible to have large middle-class democracies in which the protection of the right to property considered as the most comprehensive right will be the first object of government. And that is a quote from Federalist Paper Number 10. What is more, in constitutional government of the kind inspired by Locke and fully endorsed by the founders, justice would be more securely grounded in nature. On the grounds of Aristotelian natural right, there must be what Leo Strauss called a reasonable correspondence between the social hierarchy and the natural hierarchy. In other words, justice must be grounded in nature or natural right. This was rendered impossible in the classical world because of scarcity. What were called aristocracies, Aristotle said, were most always, almost always thinly disguised oligarchies the rule of the rich. Being rich, of course, has little to do with natural inequality or the possession of the virtues or talents required for rule. Once oligarchy was exposed, it became increasingly easy, Strauss says, to argue from the premise that natural inequality has very little to do with social inequality, that practically or politically speaking, one may safely assume that all men are by nature equal, that all men have the same natural rights, provided one uses this rule of thumb as the major premise for reaching the conclusion that everyone should be given the same opportunity as everyone else. Thus, the Lockean system adopted and adapted by the framers made it possible to improve on the ancient models from the point of view of distributive justice or natural right. Pseudo-aristocracy could now be replaced by genuine aristocracy because the increase in abundance that resulted from the emancipation of acquisition made possible a system of distributive justice based upon equal opportunity where natural talents rather than cat class or caste would be the basis for advancement. Now Strauss quoted Jefferson's 1813 letter to John Adams with evident approval. Listen to this. That form of government is best, Jefferson wrote, which provides for the most effectually for a pure selection of the natural aristoi, the naturally best, into offices of government. Strauss comments that Jefferson's statement reflected classical political philosophy's answer to the best political regime, the claim to rule which is based on merit, on human excellence, on virtue. The sentence preceding the one quoted by Strauss is no less remarkable. The natural aristocracy Jefferson wrote I considered as the most precious gift of nature for the instruction, the trusts, and government of society. And indeed it would have been inconsistent in creation to have formed man for the social state 
and not to have provided virtue and wisdom enough to, man to manage the concerns of society. The existence of the natural Aristoi is thus proof for Jefferson that creation has designed man for the social or political state. Jefferson thus agrees with Aristotle, but man is by nature a political animal. And the best regime by nature is aristocracy, pure Aristotle. And since it is evident that virtue and talents have been by nature scattered with equal hand through all its conditions, meaning in every class of society, a system of equal opportunity allowing virtue and talent to rise from all classes is a demand of natural right. Thus, the best regime of classical political philosophy could not be realized in the classical world because of scarcity, because of the prevalence of poverty. It became realizable only after Locke had articulated the natural right to property and the American founders had established a scheme of constitutional government designed to protect the right to property. Even though the right to private property may have been unknown to Aristotle and the emancipation of acquisitiveness was wholly alien to classical political philosophy, it is impossible not to see the influence of Aristotelian natural right at work in the creation of the American regime, which for the first time held out the prospect that genuine aristocracy based upon natural talents and abilities could replace the pseudo aristocracy of birth and class that had dominated the past. America is not a radically modern founding, emphatically not so. Those critics that we started out with are wrong. They are absolutely wrong. Equality of opportunity, not the accident of birth, was to be the principle of distributive justice that would animate the American regime. And this was an expression of genuine Aristotelian natural right. Well, you might be wondering, the Declaration says life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, not property. How do you account for that? Thanks for asking. <laughs> the short answer is this. Property is a necessary but not sufficient condition of human happiness. For Aristotle, happiness is a life lived according to the virtues. Property and wealth are necessary, but acquiring wealth in the proper measure is one virtue. It is necessary for happiness, but not sufficient. That's Aristotle. One prime example of Locke's influence in America can be seen in this familiar passage from George Washington's first inaugural. Here's Washington. There is no truth more thoroughly established than that there exists in the economy and course of nature an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness, between duty and advantage, between the genuine maxims of an honest and magnanimous policy and the solid rewards of public prosperity and felicity. Since we ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. Now, this statement delineating the nat natural connection between virtue and happiness is, of course, perfectly Aristotelian. Could have been copied right out of Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics. Thus, Washington and Madison, who wrote this speech, understood the pursuit of happiness to mean the pursuit of virtue. Now, it may surprise you to learn that this notable sentiment of Washington's was a close paraphrase 
of a passage from book one of Locke's an essay concerning human understanding. Madison, if not Washington, was well acquainted with Locke's essay, and it is easy to see how these two enlightened statesmen were led to an understanding of Aristotelian natural right through a reading of Locke. In their reading of the essay, the founders must have been exceedingly curious to discover that Locke never described happiness or the pursuit of happiness as a right, preferring to consider it as a moral obligation, at one point even averring that it is a perfection of our nature. That doesn't sound radically modern. It sounds just like Aristotle, does it not? Locke does not as modern critics are wont to do, present the pursuit of happiness as something idiosyncratic or subjective. Rather, according to Locke, it rests on a reasoned view of what constitutes good and evil. Happiness is an inclination and tendency of human nature, Locke argues. And it is when desires are put to the service of the ends or, or purposes discerned by reason that the pursuit of happiness becomes, in Locke's terms, our greatest good, our greatest good. Human happiness depends, Locke says, upon the distinction between liberty and license. License destroys genuine liberty because the one who indiscriminately indulges his passions is eventually ruled by his passions and becomes enslaved by them, whereas the one who rules his passions through reason enjoys the freedom that accompanies rule. Locke's reasoning here stands in stark contrast to Hobbes, who famously insisted that reason was always subordinate to passion. For Locke, in contrast, reason properly disciplined and directed controls passion and desire and directs the will to what he calls true felicity, meaning true happiness. It is active reason that forms the coral core of moral virtue for Locke. And this is how pursuit of happiness became in the Declaration of Independence a, a, both a right and a moral obligation. For the framers' understanding, the moral obligation was political. Locke, uh, in his essay on human understanding, understands the pursuit of happiness apart from any regime questions, any regime understanding. There's no talk of politics in that essay. The framers uh, understood uh, all of our rights in a political context, and they transformed the pursuit of happiness uh, into a right as well as a moral obligation. Yeah? Well, you may be wondering, where does that leave us today? And I'll just say uh, all to, uh, in a very short statement. I know you're all aware that the Supreme Court's ledger domain has transformed the Fifth Amendment's public use requirement into a public purpose one. Public purpose, of course, is, more, uh, is a more expansive concept, which allows the government greater latitude in exercising eminent domain. We've already heard Blackstone describe how the common law viewed the king as the universal landlord who parceled out property in return for feudal duties. In the most far-reaching iteration of the public purpose doctrine, in the case of uh, Kelo versus City of New London, and that was in 2005, the court in effect decided that government holds all property and public trust to be distributed based upon its evaluation of public purpose. And under the Kelo rationale, the government has indeed become the universal landlord. But now the king has been replaced by the administrative state. It is not entirely an exaggeration to say that the right to private property has effectively been abolished. All property is now hold, held in, public, in trust by government. And I would say that it's not entirely an exaggeration to say that the regime of the founders no longer exists. And I thank you for listening. <laughs> we have time.
time for some questions, and we do have some microphones so that the camera can pick up for our recording if you would wait for uh, one of those. Stay there, microphone there. Please, questions, but more importantly, objections. Thank you, Professor uh, Christopher Harris with Unhyphenated America. And the question I have, I appreciate everything you said. It's a great talk. The question I have, what would be the mechanism to undo uh, basically turning private property or turning all the property over to the government? What mechanism, what steps could, should we take or could we take? Well, <clears throat> uh, the framers had this idea. <clears throat> property was kind of an early warning system that we could uh, we can lose our property and regain our property, but assaults on liberty uh, would always uh, show up first as assaults upon the right to property. And you could be certain that assaults on the right to property would mean that assaults on liberty would sh uh, sh uh, show up shortly thereafter. So that we should take alarm immediately when assaults on the right to property uh, began. It was like an early warning system soon as the right to property, and, and they took that to mean uh, taxation without representation was one assault on the right to property. Uh, but any uh, assault on the right to property uh, should be taken very, very seriously because uh, the right uh, to liberty would be next. We should have taken alarm many, many years ago when the Supreme Court began its sub rosa reinterpretation or amendment of the Constitution to take public uh, use out of the Constitution to substitute public purpose. And we should have really demanded that that not be done. But instead, no one really made a peep. No one really was too concerned about it. There was no public outcry as there was after the the Kelo decision. You know, there was quite a bit of public outcry uh, and states were passing laws complaining about uh, uh, the Kelo decision and so on and so forth. But uh, in the early years, oh, more than 50 years ago, 50, you know, early 1900s, when the Supreme Court began to make its tri transmogrification of the Fifth Amendment, and it went relatively unnoticed. That's when we should have taken alarm. What can be done today? Well, it's going to be very difficult to, to roll back and to regain uh, the right to property. But the main thing is this. When the, the, uh, the, the founders saw uh, the right to property as a bundle of rights, those things that I mentioned to you, freedom of speech is one of the, your, your right to property. Uh, the free exercise, you notice today that freedom of speech is under attack. Free exercise of religion is under attack. The rights of conscience are under attack. And that's because it is part of the right to property. And Madison was very extens uh, expansive there when he talked about the, the right to property. Those were all of the things that were in the right to property. And an attack on any one of those rights is an attack on all of the rights. All of those rights put together, those bundle of rights uh, that Madison talked about being the right to property, that taken together is justice. And I must tell you this, that Aristotle says that the thing that preserves regimes, this is in the politics, the thing that preserves uh, regimes above all is justice. So we can say today that any attack upon the right to property is an attack upon justice. And the regime is not going to survive uh, any att uh, outright attacks upon justice. And that's what the attack upon private property is. And what can be done? I don't know. Uh, we have to roll back that Kelo decision. What are the chances of that? Uh, you know, if the president gets more appointments to the Supreme Court, uh, and you know how worried the Democrats are uh, about that. Uh, I don't know if that's a, a solution. It would only be a partial solution at best. Uh, but uh, I must say, we have to be more attentive uh, to that early warning system uh, which is the gateway to the idea of justice itself. I think we're in desperate uh, straits. City of, uh, City of New London. <laughs> there was an interesting colloquy uh, between Justices Scalia and O'Connor 
uh, and the attorney for the city of New London, they asked him, would it be okay for the, the city uh, to uh, take a Motel 6 by eminent de domain and replace it with a uh, more luxurious hotel, say a Hilton Hotel, if it produced more revenue in the, in the, uh, the attorney for the city uh, said yes, if it produced more revenue, uh, which, which was a surprising answer, absolutely surprising answer. You could take private property, give it to a, a, another person if it produced more revenue to the state or to the city. And uh, later on, this, uh, the attorney for the city said, uh, at that point I knew I had won. <laughs> and there is no argument, none whatsoever, that is more foreign to what the framers uh, of the Constitution had in mind and the framers of the Fifth Amendment. Uh, who was, by the way, James Madison uh, as well. Uh, the, no argument more f uh, alien to, to the to founders of the Constitution than w uh, what the attorney for the city of New London claims uh, won the argument for him before the Supreme Court. And it probably did. <laughs> that's, that's, that's astounding. Anyway, anybody else? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Professor Masugi. Well, quite often uh, property rights are today are uh, distinguished from human rights, which is the rights all right-thinking people should embrace, right? And, and so when did Madison's expansive notion of property, which corresponds with ancient natural right, uh, really, uh, uh, when was that uh, uh, questioned and uh, uh, fall into well, disuse. Yeah, yeah, uh, what you say is correct. I mean, what, what we hear all of the time today is that <clears throat> uh, the framers uh, put so much emphasis on the right to property that they forgot about human rights. Uh, they put so much emphasis on the right to property uh, and they did so at the expense of human rights. Well. Uh, they viewed the right to property as a comprehensive right. Uh, it was the comprehensive human right, and they didn't see any distinction or any separation between human rights and property rights. Property right was the comprehensive human right. Madison said, as you have a right to property, so you have a property in your rights. That was his famous statement in the essay that I uh, quoted from earlier. Now, uh, that idea that there was a separation between human rights and property rights began uh, with progressivism. That is to say, the, the attempt to uh, debunk the American founding, but in the Supreme Court it began in the early 1900s uh, with this idea that uh, we can ex expand government's uh, 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 role in the economy and uh, government's role in uh, managing property and, and, and economic rights. And that's when they said, we've got to have a more extan expansive uh, notion of when government can intrude on, on uh, privacy or private rights in order to uh, help economic rights and so on. So that's, that's when that happened. But you're right, it's a false dichotomy to say property rights and human rights are opposed to one another. That's simply false. The framers didn't believe that at all. Mr. Teddy. Yeah, thanks. Um, I wanted to go back to the, uh, your, your beginning remarks, your opening remarks. Um, you know that there's um, strong criticism, especially on the right, um, like the Pat Deneen book, right? <clears throat> Why liberalism failed. Y yeah. So there are critics. It, it, he says who, it's failed because it was too successful. Yeah, and that you might put it that way. Uh, so I would express it this way and then ask you to, to sort of respond to it. Whatever else you can say about similarities between Aristotle and Locke, the fact is that in the uh, moral and philosophic tradition uh, uh, of the classics through, uh, through, through uh, the Middle Ages, it was always understood that um, acquisitiveness or greed, to put the word on it, uh, was considered a vice and something that ought to be uh, suppressed or at least greatly controlled. 
But you talked a great deal about uh, 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 emancipation of acquisition for the, for the founders. So those people would say, I think, that it's true, we've become fabulously wealthy uh, by this emancipation, but isn't there, in fact, a connection between the release of that vice on the one hand and many, many of the social problems, the declining culture that we have and so on, and even our some declines in our politics as well. So yeah, no, no, I understand that. I mean, uh, capitalism, in a, you know, increasing wealth, uh, emancipation of acquisitiveness uh, is somehow low and loathsome. It's corrupted morality and so on and so forth. But I say that poverty is, poverty corrupted morality as well. It, uh, it, it, uh, it maintained tyranny of all kinds of sort. It, uh, it made uh, oligarchy inevitable. It made injustice inevitable. Sure, the relief of poverty uh, may seem low in a certain kind of way, uh, but it's uh, generous in another kind of way. It's humanitarian in another kind of way, yes? Uh, it made people perhaps greedy, uh, but it lifted a lot of people from poverty into maybe not comf uh, comfortable existence or not. It made some people rich. It made some people fabulously wealthy. But the argument that goes today from the people who, uh, I forget what they're called, the, the, Wall, uh, the uh, Never Wall Street, or wh what are they called, the Occupy Wall Street people? Their idea is that, uh, uh, is that we, we should never, uh, uh, because uh, capitalism didn't uh, elevate everyone equally, it should never have elevated anyone. I mean, the, the relief of poverty, I think, has been a good thing. Now you can look back and say, well, capitalism is really a rough system and it's corrupted m morality. But I don't think, the, the way a sophisticated reading of Locke, yes, maybe, I, I thought somebody was gonna say, well, wait a minute, one of the severest critics of, of Locke was Leo Strauss. I mean, he dug deep into Locke and said, you know, that guy read uh, the essay on human understanding uh, and some passages from the same chapter that you quoted from, uh, he read The Pursuit of Happiness as if it were idiosyncratic and do your own th kind of thing stuff and, you know, pursuit of happiness is whatever you want it to be. Well, but the framers didn't read that chapter the way Leo Strauss did. They read him uh, in, in an ordinary sense in the sense in which I read him, and Locke talks about human happiness as being the, uh, the greatest good uh, for human beings and, uh, and their greatest end and the perfection of human nature. That's the way they read him, and they read him in a common sense way, and that was very morally salutary for the country. And I think it was salutary. And you say, well, okay, we have capitalism. We, we raise people out of property, uh, poverty. Some people got wealthy. Well, you know, in the capitalist system, you can't help that, right? So should we not raise people out of poverty? We, should we not have a middle-class democracy in which we could have a system of equal opportunity, in which we could have a government, a middle-class democracy in which people who are born into poverty can, by the way. You know, what was uh, Carter? He was a peanut farmer. He becomes president of the United States, a peanut farmer? Born into poverty and other people? You know, Rich, uh, uh, Nixon? Born into lower cir circumstances, he could go to college, he goes to law school, becomes president. Some of you here today, I was born in poverty. I went to college. I became a college professor, crying out loud. I mean, that's improbable, right? If I was born uh, before uh, the American founding, I would have been born into the lowest class and I would have died in the lowest class, right? And so, you know, okay, fine, that's fine. But because some people got wealthy and, and they became, uh, you know, corrupt, and they act like rich people, and they're corrupt, and they want to corrupt other people, so we ought not to have some people elevated out of property, uh, poverty because 
It's corrupting to other people. Well, I don't know. There are, there are trade-offs. You know, the statesmen in the world. Look, I'll tell you this. No one, everyone is born into a world that they did not create. Am I right about that? We were all born into a world that we didn't create. But we have an obligation to change the world for the better. We all have that o obligation. And I always tell, well, I don't see uh, an abundance of young people here, but there are some young people. My generation has failed the next, uh, the next generation to mine. I don't know how many generations are <laughs> behind me now, but <laughs> being an old guy that I am. But I failed the next generation because I didn't leave the next generation better off. But the framers of our country were born into a, uh, a world that they did not create. But they moved further and faster than any other generation in history. But they couldn't change everything. There were some intractable problems that they could not change. But they went further and faster. Look, the principle of statesmanship is this. Cure as many evils as you can, while you can, without destroying the basis for curing further evils. You can't do everything. If it means that you have to bring in, Locke knew this. Locke was well aware of this. He wrote a book called The Reasonableness of Christianity. And I can tell you one thing. I can tell you two things or three things, but I'll tell you this one thing. <laughs> if Locke hadn't written, uh, uh, written that book, and another little book that he wrote called, uh, what is it called? The Book on Religious Freedom, I forget. Yeah, Letter on Toleration. Uh, Letter on Toleration. If he hadn't written Reasonableness of Christianity in a letter on toleration, what made the American founding possible, and I do not exaggerate, is that at the American founding, there was no quarrel between religion and politics. I can put it in fancier terms, but I'll just leave it at that. No theological political quarrels what the preachers were saying on Sundays and publishing in their pamphlets, they were praising the kind of government that these guys were debating in the convention. They were saying, we need a government, and these guys were saying, we need that government that the ministers are preaching on Sundays. There was no quarrel. Those of you who have read uh, Shakespeare's history plays know about the quarrels uh, that they were having in England. You know, uh, Burke says, one of the great advantages of the, uh, of the English Constitution is that we, uh, succession is built into the Constitution. We don't have any quarrels about it. King dies, next king is right there. King dies, the next king is right there. Well, was he right about that? Read the, uh, read the uh, Shakespeare history play. What are all the wars about? Who's the next king is gonna be, right? So these guys couldn't fix everything, but they fixed as much as they could. And they went further than anybody. That Declaration of Independence was a world historical event. That changed the world and is still changing the world. You see those people over protesting over in Hong Kong? What are they, what are they holding up? Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and other places in the world. That was a world historical event. They couldn't, they couldn't put it into effect all at once. Look, ideas are rarely capable of implementation all at once. Am I right about that? You can't translate theory into practice all at once. You go as far as you can, while you can, without destroying the basis for going further. And that's what they did. And they were born into a world they didn't create, just like all the rest of us. And they knew their obligation to change the world for the better. And they went further. I am sure of this. They went further than any other generation in history. 
And that's what I'm trying to say. People say today, look, this American founding was low and loathsome. It relied on low ideas, bad ideas, radically modern ideas. You've heard of all of this. There are hundreds of books, and there are hundreds of books that are being written today about this. And it is simply not true. Radically modern ideas. Locke was a radical, uh, radical modern guy. Uh, he thought that private interests were the only engine of politics and that uh, people ought to be selfish. They ought not to think about virtue and all of the good things or the public good or the public interest or pursuit of happiness meant just do what is in your own self-interest. Don't think about anybody else. Don't think about your country. Simply not true. All you have to do is go and study. It took me four years of concentrated study. This essay on human understanding where he talks about the pursuit of happiness is an 800 page book and it is densely written. Densely written. See these glasses here? I didn't have to have glasses before I started reading that. <laughs> I can't think of a better point to stop on. That was a great point. <laughs>